Good afternoon. Um, for those of you whom I haven't met, my name is John Marshall, and I'm the VP for Student Services. I'll be your uh, tour guide this morning or this afternoon, whatever time it is. Our hope is uh, we'll be effective with your time, but I would encourage you to ask questions. Hopefully, we stay on track. We'll be out of here in about 45 minutes or so. And the hope is today that we are going to be able to make it through um, Title IX and a brief recap and refresher for many of us on um, Title VII related employment, related sexual harassment prevention. And uh, I am not a Title VII expert by any stretch of the imagination, but my friend Jill Knuckles is out today, so uh, I'm gonna be covering that piece of it. Really just a refresher for most of us uh, about how to maintain the kind of uh, atmosphere with our colleagues that we all hope and expect from one another. So with that, uh, today's training, we're hoping to cover um, briefly recap of what the law actually says about this and where it affects us, both for our students and for us as uh, employees and colleagues. Who does the law protect from sexual harassment and sexual assault? Um, identifying this sexual misconduct, sexual harassment and sexual assault are the terms we're gonna use and we'll realize there's a variety of behaviors that are underneath those umbrellas and we'll try and specify some of those. And then um, resources. How do we report this? What are our obligations as members of this campus community? And how do we support the students here that we serve? Um, so broadly, that's what we're gonna try and capture. If you have questions, just stop me along the way. Uh, I'll move around and try and answer and keep Bronson on his toes over here, so. All right. Um, so who is protected? And we're gonna start on this idea of um, workplace sexual harassment, and uh, hopefully this is a refresher for many of us. Everyone is protected. And it does not matter where the conduct uh, comes from. It could be a contractor, it could be a visitor to campus, somebody who's working on a construction site or the Pepsi delivery guy. It could be a faculty or a supervisor or a colleague or a student harassing you. It doesn't matter where the conduct comes from, um, we are all protected under this irrespective uh, of our class. Just some obvious uh, points. The, the, the victim does not need to be of the opposite sex. Um, it doesn't even have to be the intended target who is affected by this, okay? Uh, an obvious joke is, a, you know, an inappropriate joke between two colleagues that maybe the receiving party was not the one that was offended, but somebody else was in earshot and having to listen to that and is affected by that, uh, they're covered by that, and that behavior is prohibited. Um, the, the law and the way we lay this out is pretty clear in our professional standards uh, handbook. So if you go to HR and you click on the policy manuals, you'll see that professional handbook, right? And it lists a whole series of these things. So I'm gonna go over these, but these are all widely available to you between the trustee manual and our personnel manual. So um, unwelcome is a key term here, sexual advances or sexual conduct. Requests for sexual favors or other conduct of a sexual nature conduct constitutes sexual harassment when it is explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of employment or academic performance. This would be the thought of a quid pro quo. And the other piece that is prohibited is um, a hostile environment. And that is created when uh, we are trying to <sighs> affect, interfere, uh, intimidate, uh, limit, our colleagues or our students' ability to um, do their job or benefit from their education here. And so let's dive into these. A quid pro quo uh, is just the lawyer's way of saying this for that, and it really means um, sexual favor or some kind of exchange for uh, whether it's workplace or, or academic. I know this sounds like a stretch, but unfortunately, um, we do get reports of this, in uh, whether it's in the classroom or in employment situations, so uh, just be aware of it, and implicit or explicit, if you are um, seeing or you think you're seeing these sorts of things, the hope is that we are being sensitive and aware of these. Um, the, the more prevalent, I would say, uh, kinds of things that we face are this idea of a hostile environment, because this gets into um, a lewd email or a lewd joke or, or a comment that's taken the wrong way. And this idea of what constitutes a uh, hostile environment 
is not a cut and dry issue necessarily. We try and look at the totality of the circumstance. This morning, one of, the, um, one of our colleagues asked, what if a student wants to give me a hug? Says, I would like to give you a hug. My answer is, uh, it depends. If that is a serial hugger who is um, unresponsive to repeated admonitions that I don't want to be hugged, uh, that's a student we want to sit down with, right? Or a colleague who you've told them, no, thank you. I'd like my personal space. I don't want to be hugged. Um, they need to respect that. The idea here is that it is unwanted. Um, the other idea is that it is uh, repeated or pervasive, right? And the last component is whether how severe the conduct is. And so we try and look at the totality of the circumstance, the hope being that we are going to hold each other to a higher standard. Um, students oftentimes are going to maybe need a little more training and opportunities for learning, right? So the totality of the circumstance of a hostile environment is really what is critical. And again, this, um, this can happen anywhere. Many of us have uh, responsibilities that take us off campus, right? So whether we are a coach on a road trip, whether we are a faculty advisor taking a, a student group to a conference, whatever the case might be, those are protected areas. Those are times and places in which that behavior still is something that the university has to monitor and be accountable for. So if there is harassment that's going on on a bus trip, we are accountable for that. We've got to speak up and we've got to point that out. Same on trips, hotels that students are staying at, uh, faculty are staying at, conferences, et cetera. You get the point. It doesn't matter whether it happens here. It matters that uh, there is a tie back to the university. Uh, we try and look at this idea of a reasonable person on a university campus. I realize that is a very broad definition. The notion here, though, is, uh, once again, um, we're trying to be respectful and civil to one another. We're trying to create an environment that we can all be proud of, uh, that includes everybody, where um, we are, in fact, giving the benefit of the doubt to each other as colleagues. But at the end of the day, we need to treat everybody with respect. So as... as um, as we look at this, how we judge these sorts of things comes down to this idea of uh, what's the straight face test in, in this behavior. Um, so here's the laundry list, and here, these are examples. I'm hoping that these are, um, let me stop there. I'm hoping these are all things that are, you're nodding your head like, yeah, that, I shouldn't do that here at work. Um, I would point out to you, though, the lewd electronic communications. I have, a, um, I have a doctor friend in the community who likes to send inappropriate emails, and every time I've got to tell him, quit sending me this, right? Like, I've got to block you. I can't, like, don't do this. Those things that come across your email, don't forward them on, because then you've assumed responsibility and you've helped carry on that conduct. So you've got to stop it, you've got to point it out, and you've got to ask that person to cease in that behavior. Um, again, this idea of pervasive, repeated, unwanted conduct. Um, yeah, don't give each other back rubs for the most part. I realize in the rec center that uh, we have, right, I think that's a thing, right? We have massages and we pay people and voluntarily unwanted, again, is the idea here. So, um, yeah, stay in your own personal space, right? That's what we tell our kindergartners. Same idea. Doesn't have to, it can be verbal conduct, could be nonverbal, can be items, could be electronic conduct, um, physical, and the two types are quid pro quo and hostile environment. So um, big picture, that's our recap. I would tell you, um, we all have a different compass. We all have different sensitivities to these things. So in terms of treating each other with respect, we've got to listen to each other. When somebody says, hey, that's kind of outside my boundaries. Uh, that's part of being a good colleague, even if you think it's harmless. Um, my advice to you is just back it off. Um, how do we bring these things forward? So irrespective of where the um, behavior stems from, we need to bring that forward. And so for the purposes of workplace sexual harassment and so forth, we want to always handle these things at the lowest level possible. But our policies are pretty straightforward. If it is an employee-related item, um, 
that needs to get to HR. If it is a student-related item, that needs to get to my office. Um, and we have a number of Title IX coordinators or deputy coordinators on this campus that can help with that. They're on the website, they're published and available, so you have a lot of resources uh, to use in order to report that. But I, I do need to tell you, we all have a responsibility to report this, okay? It is, it, it's just one of our professional standards, one of our obligations is to report this. And this becomes a higher stakes game in the context of students in Title IX. A, a quick word about relationships with students. Um, so the policies are pretty clear. If you have a relationship with a student where they are your, in your class, they are a work-study student that you are supervising, they are a player on your team that you coach, uh, they are an advisee of yours, um, an amorous or romantic relationship with that student is not appropriate. And I can honestly say in my nine years here, I've never seen a uh, professional student amorous romantic relationship that's really turned out great. So I, I, let them graduate, I guess, is what I'm saying to you. Let them graduate first. Um, but there are some very specific places in which we say just not appropriate, right? And, and I hope we kind of get where those are. If we control their playing time, if we control their grades, if we control their work hours and their professional conduct and so forth as a student, just not appropriate to engage uh, with that. All right. The Maverick Guide is where we lay out all these student policies and expectations. And, and by the way, students have and do, in fact, sometimes harass professionals, sometimes sexually harass professionals. And so we have a process for holding those students accountable and the expectation is that there's a lot of education that goes along with that. Um, but those are areas that uh, can occur. It's not just with colleagues, right? So um, we want to be aware of that. And frankly, as we're training students to go out into the world, I think we've got an even higher obligation to take that sort of boundary probing borderline uh, behavior and call it out for what it is and educate them um, about the potential downfalls of that sort of pervasive behavior on down the road as professionals. All right, so um, that's all I'm gonna say. Any questions about sexual harassment, right? Yeah, be polite and respectful to each other, I think is the, is the message. All right, so we're gonna transition into Title IX. Title IX is uh, shorthand for the uh, amendment to the Education Reauthorization Act of something like 1973. What it really says is that nobody shall be denied or limited in their ability to access, enjoy, benefit from education uh, based on discrimination uh, around sex. Over the years, uh, obviously we all um, probably became some fam somewhat familiar with this around sports participation, but that's grown a lot over the years and I think um, the federal government has clarified in many ways in, over the years what they're really talking about. And they're really addressing this most broadly. So sexual harassment, sexual assault, and the like. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. Sexual misconduct violates Title IX when it rises to a level that denies or limits someone's ability to participate in or benefit from academic, educational, extracurricular, athletic, or other school programs. Sexual misconduct occurs and the university knew or should have known about it. The university and its employees must respond. The should have known is the part that we all have to participate in here. We are all mandated reporters, okay? There are very limited circumstances where we allow for confidentiality, and that's really reserved for things like clergy and professional counseling, mental health counselors. Um, for all intents and purposes, we are all what the law refers to as responsible employees. And what that means is, if we are aware of behavior that is of a sexual nature, is affecting a student, or is perpetrated by a student, um, we've gotta speak up, okay? And this is a challenge as it relates to things like sexual assault. If a student wants to disclose to you that they've been a victim of some behavior and they're asking you for confidentiality, this creates some challenges because um, we will do everything we can to keep it as confidential as possible, but we cannot guarantee and you cannot represent that it will be absolutely confidential and you cannot represent if a student comes to you and says, I need to share something with you, but you can't tell anybody. Right? And 
for some of you, that's happened, right? A student has said, I need to tell you this, but you cannot tell anybody. You have got to hear that and say, I, I can't promise that. I'm a mandated reporter. Let me get you the appropriate resources and to the right people so that you can get this information forward. This is a challenging part. If the university should have known, this is what they're talking about. Student discloses a sexual harassment charge or a sexual assault to you, the university should have known because your job is then to report that information. So we'll talk a little more about that. Um, so sexual harassment, sexual assault falls under this as a much more severe form of sexual harassment. Could be everything from um, verbal to physical conduct that is unwanted uh, and non-consensual. All right, so what is our obligation? Well, first things first is we need to take a report and we need to investigate promptly and thoroughly We've, we have a number of trained Title IX investigators here, um, some of our colleagues who have gone through a fair amount of training to ensure that they are prepared and ready to investigate a Title IX um, alleged complaint. And so they, their task is to really go fact find as best they can, and they've been trained in all the ways to do that as effectively and as fairly as possible. Take reasonable steps to stop sexual misconduct. You'll see in a few slides here, we use things like interim measures. These are the things that we do immediately uh, to ensure that this conduct is not continuing. Even if it's alleged, while we're figuring out what happened, we're gonna have to take interim measures. That may be academic, it might be living, uh, could be a number of things that we'll look at. Take reasonable steps to prevent it from happening again. Um, a good example is if we have two students that are in the same class and there's um, sexual harassment that's gone on, well, we're moving one of those students, right? There's going to be a, uh, probably a section change where they're going to transition out of that class into another class or maybe just out of that class in total with a, uh, with a withdrawal. The notion is that if once we know about it, once we've been able to determine responsibility, we've got to ensure that it does not pervade. It's not continuing to occur or reoccur. Uh, the recovery of victims. I want to pause for a minute. We use this term victims a few times here. You'll also hear the term complainant, respondent. And the language here is really based on what hat are we wearing in this process. For some of us that have a responsibility to adjudicate these kind of complaints, you'll hear us use terms like complainant and respondent because that's the most value neutral language we can come up with where we say we're not prejudging what did or did not occur. We're trying to determine what occurred. Right? So for some of us, we have to maintain that uh, as bias-free, neutral position as possible, so we'll use language like complainant respondent. Others at the university, their job is to advocate and support those students. And so you'll hear them use words like survivor or victim um, when it comes to things like sexual assault. So that's not because it's a political difference, it's a different hat that we're wearing in the process, and we're trying to support students in the process as fairly as we can and as effectively as we can. And then preventing retaliation. That's just uh, an education thing where we have to ensure that the grievance does not reoccur, that we prevent somebody who has been held accountable from going and retaliating against a victim or survivor a second time. All right, uh, we talked a little bit about this in the context of Title VII. It's the same around Title IX. It does not matter where the conduct occurred. This is especially true as it relates to sexual assaults. Um, we take, we are going to review one that occurs on campus, even though we report it differently and we may respond a little bit differently, we're going to take that just as seriously, hold that student accountable as if it happened at a, at a house in one of the neighborhoods. Um, that's not true of all student conduct, but it is most certainly true of sexual misconduct. If it happened out in the county or out in Fruta, it does not matter, or on a road trip, you're still going to hold that student accountable and investigate that as best we can. Um, online courses, uh, just a quick word to those of you faculty who are teaching online or hybrid courses or something like that, just be aware of this. Sexual harassment can very much take place in those online forums, right? And um, this is just something that we just need to be aware of and, and recognize that exists. All right, so sexual violence is misconduct involving non-consensual physical sexual acts. Um, sexual assault is the umbrella term for a variety of things and can range from unlawful sexual contact all the way through uh, the most egregious form of an attempted or completed rape, okay? Those all fall under the same banner 
of sexual assault, which for some of us is maybe uh, requires a little recalibrating. I know for, for me, I, I would associate a sexual assault as a rape. Um, and the fact is that it's actually an umbrella term for a broader range of um, activities there. So appreciate that when we're talking about, about these. So what is consent? Some universities have tried to navigate um, this in a way that I think is, is really challenging. We have opted to simply adopt Colorado criminal statute and consent is fairly straightforward and I'm just gonna read it to you. Consent means cooperation and act or attitude pursuant to an exercise of free will with knowledge of the nature of the act. A current or previous relationship shall not be sufficient to constitute consent. Submission under the influence of fear shall not constitute consent. Um, and th these follow-ups are some of like jury instructions and so forth that are, that are uh, held within the law. Consent is not when someone is physically helpless, such as asleep, unconscious, or otherwise unable to indicate willingness to engage in sexual activity. When someone, by reason of immaturity, mental disease, or mental defect, or intoxication, is manifestly unable and is known or reasonably should be known to be unable to make a reasonable judgment to the nature of the conduct. This comes into play because I would tell you that a very, very small proportion of our allegations of sexual assault do not involve drugs or alcohol. And so oftentimes we're left in this place about was consent given under the influence of alcohol, usually. And, and these are some of the standards that, um, that we have to use. And so witness statements and things about, you know, was this person having a hard time speaking? Were they slurring speech? Were they having a hard time with their balance, et cetera? They're manifestly known to be intoxicated, in other words. Um, these are all things that play into the considerations. Um, but it, it, it's incredibly challenging, as you can all appreciate, especially when multiple students or multiple parties were involved and they were all impaired at some level. This becomes a very challenging thing for us to sort out. Um, okay, we talked about responsible employees. That is all of us. So if you take nothing else away from this training, I would ask you to remember, you are a responsible employee. You have a mandate to report. And we have a variety of ways that you can do that. But when a student comes to you and says, please don't tell anybody, your answer needs to be, I am a mandated reporter. I can help you get the right resources. I can help facilitate that, but we have to tell somebody so the university can act, okay? Um, all right, where to report? So if it involves students in any way, shape, or form, it's appropriate to let my office know we have tried to simplify this by putting an online reporting form, both on the external website and on MavZone. Um, it's, it's now known as Report It, okay? And that's available on the Safety tab as a resource, as well as on your MavZone. There are links where you can do that, and it's gonna prompt you with all the right checklists of information that you need to include in that. Um, the SART hotline, the Sexual Assault Response Team, Many of your colleagues are actually volunteers in this as either first responders or advocates or as investigators. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, and I would tell you as you're having this training and this, this conversation, if you are in a season of your professional life where you can help and serve the university in this way, I would encourage you to sign up and volunteer for that SART team. Um, those volunteers carry a phone a week at a time on call, 24 hours a day uh, for seven days. And they take calls like this, where they take a report. And it might be at midnight, might be at 7 a.m. Um, and we help train support staff and faculty to help serve in that role. So that's another opportunity. That SART line can also assist you if a student comes to you and says, hey, I, I don't want to tell anybody else, but I need to share this with you. Your answer could be, you know what, let's have you call the SART line, okay? because it's really important that you get the health care and the mental health and the accommodations that you need to be safe and healthy and, and know your rights as a victim. So let's make that call together. You've effectively now accomplished what you need to accomplish by that student self-reporting and, um, and really just gets right to the point. So that's, that's one option that you may have. Um, yeah, and if the... Uh, alleged perpetrators and employee that needs to go up to HR so we can initiate a, a different uh, process there. Unfortunately, this does occur, right, where we've got student and staff um, sexual misconduct claims between the two, and so it, it can get a little bit, a little bit challenging. But we've fairly clear policies in this, and 
and the process works well. Um, this reporter's checklist is actually um, embedded in the report it form. So I would just tell you, if you use that online form, you don't have to remember any of these things. Uh, it's there for you, it'll walk you through step by step. If you have the information, you put it in there. If you don't, you don't. Um, but it's gonna immediately notify in real time the individuals that have to take action in terms of providing advocacy and support for the student, the conduct and um, adjudication process, and then the compliance on Title IX. So that all happens automatically when you use that report it form. Um, we talked about confidentiality. The, the caveat I'll put on this is when a student comes to you for confidentiality and says, I really don't, I want this to be confidential, the answer is the university is gonna take every step possible to maintain the wishes of that, um, that complainant. There are times, um, and I can think of a couple where the university has said, I'm sorry, but there appears to be a pattern or an ongoing threat to the campus, in which case we have an obligation to act and put a stop to that. Does that make sense to you? So there are times where we've had a student say, I, I don't want this to go forward, I don't want a complaint, I don't want that other person contacted, and for the most part, the answer is okay, we're gonna abide by your wishes. But if we then have evidence or information that would lead us to think, actually, we've got a bigger problem here. We have a pattern and potentially other students or the campus is at risk, that would be a rare circumstance when we would ignore the wishes of the complainant and move ahead anyway to protect campus safety. Just a word about criminal process. These, the university process is mandated by Title IX. It's very, very straightforward and, and we're moving on this. But when you really pause and think about an egregious act like a sexual assault or a rape, um, an appropriate outcome for a rape is not expulsion, it's prison. And so our task at a high level is to ensure that we work closely with law enforcement and we do not mess up a survivor's right to a, uh, a criminal justice process that can work in their favor. And so we really try and work carefully with the police to ensure we don't screw up their investigation, even though sometimes what we're asked to do by the federal government and what their process is gonna do can be in, in conflict. Um, that's why we work really closely with the GJPD to avoid those circumstances. But just recognize those are parallel tracks. Um, we've gotta act one way or another. Criminal justice may or may not be involved. And so that sometimes serves as a complication, but over the years our relationship with the PD has been good enough, we've been able to navigate most of those. Um, but the two are independent of one another, I guess, is the bottom line. Um, all right, so we've, we've chatted about this need to take action. A, a little bit about the context. So for the most part, since the last time we, we gathered, uh, and for some of you, you weren't here at the last, there's not been a lot changed in the national environment in terms of the legal and regulatory framework. The only caveat is that there's, there's some lawsuits right now that are active from a sister institution, uh, removed a student who's now sued both the federal government and the institution around this idea of these dear colleague letters and federal guidance. Um, and for most of us, it's kind of in the weeds, but bottom line is they're, they're challenging whether or not the federal government guidance is legal and appropriate because they didn't go through rulemaking and all these other things. So, We'll stay up to date, we're watching it carefully. The, the AG's office is helping us keep an eye on that, but we feel really good about our process and the compliance. And, and I think the best illustration was when the White House put out its uh, Not Alone report, they basically came up with a series of recommendations. And, um, and I think you can feel good about the fact that your colleagues have done a great job here of putting us in a good position to stay ahead of this and really be responsive to our student needs. Uh, as well as being in compliance with the law. So a um, lot of proactive things. We continue to make steps every year in terms of improving our process um, so that it is as fair as possible and as accountable and responsive as possible. Those aren't always, don't, aren't always easy to do. Um, we've talked about these prevalence rates and, and I will tell you, I think at some point they become a distraction because the reality is once you've dealt with one of these students, one is too many. So our focus is how do we ensure that we know this happens on campus, we know that sexual assaults are underreported in large numbers, we know that certain vulnerable populations tend to be victimized at a higher rate uh, or less likely to report. These are all things that we know. 
Our challenge, though, is really to make sure we are as responsive as we can, and that means all of us paying close attention uh, and making sure we know our resources to get students the help they need and hold students accountable when they've acted in a way that is uh, wrong. Um, our values and our value statement, as of today, we're launching a, a Title IX website that is a page with a series of resources uh, here at CMU that kind of accumulates all these things in one place. So our statements, our compliance, our resources, all of those things are going to be in one place. And you'll get an email as a follow-up to this as we launch that effort. Um, but it's really just existing resources all pulled together in one place to make it easy for you if you have questions about any of this. And it also addresses things like um, our Board of Trustees, our administration, our Faculty Senate, all of these bodies. We've all said the same thing collectively, which is, um, this, is a, this is a place that needs to be inclusive, it needs to be respectful. It's a place where we're not going to tolerate people um, harming one another and disrespecting uh, one another. All right, so we talked a little bit about that. The second half of the page that I'd like to point your attention to is what are some of these interim measures that we put into place? For your benefit, when a, a report comes in, the very first thing we're going to do is assign a Title IX coordinator or deputy coordinator. That person is going to ensure right out of the gate that the complainant has an advocate and the respondent has an advocate, a university-trained resource and advocate to ensure that they are there to do nothing but support that student and help them through what is otherwise a pretty tough process. Um, those folks are not there to prejudge or adjudicate the process. It, they're simply there to support our students. We're also going to ensure that they get health care right out of the gate if they so desire that they're going to get a SANE exam or a forensic exam um, right away and any other health care needs. They're going to have access to law enforcement if they choose to pro uh, proceed with a criminal complaint that we've provided them with access to law enforcement. Um, interim measures about safety. Where are they sleeping tonight? Right? We have a whole series of steps in place where we can ensure that they are safe for the night and that there's not an ongoing situation. If those two students live in the same residence hall, we're going to generally take the respondent, move them across campus, and place what we call a no-contact order on both those students, which is effectively a civil restraining order. And it just is there for the protection of both students while we figure out what is going on. Um, academic accommodations. For you faculty, sometimes you'll get kind of an opaque note from my office, right, saying there's a student, they're facing a substantial life challenge and, or medical issue or something like that, and we're working closely with them. Um, sometimes it's, it's these survivors, okay? So bear that in mind. We want to do everything we can to accommodate them academically. Sometimes that means they go home for a few weeks. Sometimes that means they need to go get some mental health care. Um, it, it could mean a variety of different things. So collectively, through good communication, our hope is we can provide those kind of accommodations. Sometimes it's um, moving somebody out of a class section into a different class section while we figure this out. This uh, investigation is supposed to take about 60 days. And at the end of that 60 days, our Title IX investigator is going to provide findings, not responsible or, not, or, or responsible, but rather just findings. Here's what I could find from the evidence, from the witnesses, from the statements, and summarize those things. And effectively, anything that is not unfounded, okay, it's there, the student was never there, there's no evidence they were even in that building, et cetera. Short of that, it's going to a conduct board hearing. And this is two students, two faculty, two staff, who are then going to determine whether or not someone is responsible for this misconduct and what the appropriate sanction is. Um, and that is where the, the process then, there's an appeal process as well, but effectively that's how we then finally are going to hold a student accountable. And the notion is that more or less we're going to stay within that 60-day time frame, um, but for extenuating circumstances. All right. Um, Oh, the last thing I was going to say is on Cleary data. The, we're require, we are required by the federal government to report data about crimes on campus. And just know, when you look at that data, it is simply that, that territory that we immediately own or control. So all the house parties in this area, et cetera, any sexual assaults that happen there are not going to show up in that data. Um, you know, as a general rule, you know, it, it's all over the board. Some of these may happen in a residence hall. Many of them don't. Many of them happen out in house parties and so forth when it comes to, to reports of sexual assault. 
All right. Um, so we talked about what those resources are. The reported resource, I, I would encourage you to get familiar with that. Um, just go double click on that. It's on the safety webpage or on MavZone. Just make sure you're familiar with it because that is our number one way of funneling information to the right place in a timely fashion where we can act. And once you've done that, once you've submitted that report, um, you've now done your part to ensure that, that the university is compliant. That makes sense. We've got SART cards, little business cards that you can stick in your wallet. We've got some other resources in the back. And again, a sign-up sheet if you determine um, you'd like to be part of a team that is helping to support our students uh, that are facing some pretty tough situations from time to time. So um, that said, I think that is all I have with the uh, formal part of this presentation. I'll take any questions that you might have for those of you who are still awake. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs>